Hey everybody, it's Tom and I'm coming to you today. We're going to sort of shift the focus away from the political for a moment and examine questions around the philosophy of mind. In particular, to get the ball rolling, we're going to look at the issue of whether the mind can be reduced to the brain. Or, to put it more colloquially, well, that's relatively colloquial, but you know what we're getting at is, are we just the outcome of so many physical and chemical processes? Are we, as someone like Wilfred Sellers has suggested, simply a complex physical system? Or is there something more? Now, uh, before I sketch three distinct but related arguments that give us great pause, uh, before uh, assuming a material position, I want to talk a little bit about what is the relevance of this reflection to other matters. And it pertains to the issue of the will or volition. What you have coming out of the 18th century and the success of Newtonian mechanics is a real anxiety over the viability of human freedom, which, ironically enough, in tandem with the emergence of the scientific revolution, was central to the political developments of that time, as in fact we saw, for instance, in our discussions around the French Revolution, etc. But, if Newtonian mechanics were in fact the name of the game, it seemed that excluded the possibility of human freedom. Now, a lot has happened since the 18th century, including the um, supersession of Newtonian mechanics by other frameworks, most notably the Einsteinian frameworks, and also uh, quantum mechanics, etc., etc. And those supersessions have created a kind of a greater logical space in which some people um, believe it's possible to reinsert freedom. But let's not lean too heavily on whatever the uh, state of the art may be in science today, because that is a uh, constantly shifting landscape, and one on which uh, we can situate ourselves only provisionally. We're going to abstract from those particulars and instead look at questions which um, whose resolution whose resolutions are not actually going to be contingent on the state of contemporary science. Um, but the main thing here is as I was beginning. The brain has a, so many physical processes. If this represents some of our person, insofar as that model or that frame is more or less consonant with a mechanical vision of the cosmos, it excludes human freedom or throws in, in the light of being a mere illusion. And thus, uh, and thus you see that the matter is not one of mere trivial or academic preoccupation. So, so much by way of preface and allusion to the significance of the question of whether the mind can be reduced to the brain beyond whatever interest it has in and of itself. I want to sketch those three arguments that strongly point to uh, the resistance of the reductionist position. They are, or have been termed, the arguments from knowledge, explanation, and conceivability. Probably most famously by uh, David Chalmers, whose fine book, The Conscious Mind, I highly recommend. Uh, I also put a link to his website, because besides for his book, he has lots of articles there on his website, and uh, other people who have made similar positions uh, might include, for instance, uh, Joy Gon Kim, whose uh, book, uh, The Philosophy of Mind, is a very fine introductory uh, sketch. Uh, is definitely worth looking into, if you'll pardon the dangled preposition, 
and uh, someone else in the ballpark, uh, Saul Kripke, who did some interesting work um, on what seems like a narrow logical concerns, but uh, it back in the uh, back in the seventies and eighties, and he's still relevant today. Um, these are these are guys who have uh, put things out around this issue that are definitely worth scrutinizing. Start with the argument from knowledge. The argument from knowledge goes something like this, all right? If you take the physical world and put it all together, what is it that we can explain thereby? As far as the brain goes, you can pretty much get 99.9% .9 of things under that umbrella. Structure, function, things like uh, memory and cognition, uh, the sensory, spatial, uh, visual, oral, all the rest of it, you can sort of begin to tell a story which takes these individual dimensions of neurological process and subsumes them under a physicalist account. But that remaining residue is of incredible moment. What is that remaining residue? That remaining residue is consciousness, the bare fact of experience. It seems that what one encounters is a raw difference in kind between two species of occurrence, or at least an epistemic guide, or actually an epistemic divide um, between two uh, categories of understanding, right? Uh, Thus, since virtually everything can be explained materially except consciousness, it is advanced that consciousness is not itself physical. It may have some intimate relationship with the physical, but it cannot be reductively related to the physical. The uh, most uh, popular position now is that that relationship is one of supervenience, which is a logical relationship in which if you have two sets of facts, let us say A facts and B facts, if um, the A facts are set in such a way, then we then have the B facts, if the A facts supervene on the B facts, right, um, what happens is you can't vary the B facts without having a variation in the A facts. Um, and it, it, what we'll do is we'll come back and do a different video on supervenience in itself because it, that deserves a sort of more elaborate treatment. But it's something of a digression since we're just sketching what the three main arguments are here. Uh, obviously, um, what has to be elucidated for that argument of explanation to work, the argument from explanation to work, is what exactly is entailed or meant by the physical such that it doesn't seem we can fit consciousness within that box. And I think a sort of a very sort of uh, intuitive way of looking at it is this. Uh, if you take um, another example, uh, the idea of just a billiard table, right, you know, and all those balls running into each other, you know, over and over again. This is sort of a popular sketch of what things are like in the subatomic world. It doesn't seem in any way inferable that if, even if you knew everything about those billiard balls and how they related and all that stuff, that you could derive or predict consciousness as emergent from those sorts of processes. And by analogy, understand the atomic world in that way can own everything about it, and yet in no way does it seem from atomic and molecular interactions and electrical interactions that something like consciousness would actually emerge. And thus, as some people put it, the question is, why does the universe not just happen in the dark? Uh, and this actually is a very, very interesting rabbit hole down which we could go, but let's keep on track and move to the other two 
arguments which resist the reduction of mind, brain, or consciousness to physicality. And those are the arguments from explanation and conceivability. Oh, no, no, that was the argument from knowledge and conceivability. Uh, the conceivability argument, in a sense, I've already sort of hinted at it with my remarks about billiard balls and all that. But uh, it is that we can um, conceive of an entity which is physically identical to us in every way but which is bereft of our conscious experience. A sort of very sophisticated automaton that mimicked us um, all the way down, but which despite that simulation, similarity, really identity, uh, physical identity, um, not ontological identity, you know what I mean. Intuitively, I don't want to mean, right? You can still conceive of this physically identical person as being bereft of consciousness in a very similar way that we don't actually know if anybody else is conscious, right? The person with whom you're speaking, you don't know if I'm conscious. You can conceive of me as just being an automaton, right? Right? And, the, and of course, no one seriously entertains that, uh, but the very fact of that conceivability indicates that there is a differential, a very relevant differential between the merely physical universe and the conscious universe, which is evidenced by the fact that we very easily can separate those terms in our mind. And then the third argument is the argument from knowledge. Um, by the way, the argument from conceivability that I just ran over very quickly is sometimes called the zombie argument because that physical identity, your zombie twin, right, they're a zombie because they don't actually have an internal life. Um, then there's the knowledge argument, um, which is what I'm about to run over right here. And uh, you know, personally, I find it um, a very powerful one. And, and, is, it, and it goes like this, right? You can know everything there is to know about the color red you know everything about the electromagnetic magnetic radiation and its wavelength and oscillations and so forth and how it's you know processed by the eye and run through the filter of the brain and all the rest of it you can know this all discreetly down to the cross T and the dotted I and yet you still might not know what it is like to see the color red. And that's just an arbitrarily chosen experience. That's true of any experience. You can know everything there is about a given food, how mechanically it's going to affect your taste buds and all that, and you still wouldn't necessarily know what it's like to taste that food or to drink water or to hear this piece of music. Right, All these pointers direct us to a kind of encounter with the fact that experience has an irreducible quality to it, a quality, as in qualia. Qualia is uh, sort of the, the suchness of experience as it's uh, more uh, technically glossed in a lot of the literature. Right. Uh, and uh, this is really somewhat astonishing. So the outcome of these three arguments that hang together, the argument from explanation, conceivability, and knowledge, is that our world is grounded in something which seems utterly irreducible to that notion which uh, is seen as fundamentally constitutive of the universe in the physicalist account, uh, namely matter, right? Consciousness simply does not fit within that conceptual box, at least not 
in any obvious way in as much as how we contemporarily conceive of matter. What is matter, right? That's the question which is begged. And I'm going to return to that in a few days. I want to think about it and sort of marshal my thoughts a little bit more lucidly uh, before I do that. Do so, right? Um, though by way of adumbration or foreshadowing, I think what we arrive is a perhaps startling possibility. Namely that the mind, that mind and that matter are perhaps two sides of the same coin. And the reason that the reductionist tact collapses is because rather than appreciating the inextricability of these terms, it actually wants to truncate or eliminate the mental or the conscious uh, side of the equation in uh, the interest, let us say, of explanatory parsimony. But the result is an incredibly diminished picture of the universe, uh, and one which I argue has very dangerous implications politically and otherwise. Uh, uh, so, so much then by an initial sketch of issues in philosophy of mind and three arguments that are often marshaled uh, to resist the reductionist tact. There's another important argument that I'm going to touch on here in a few days, and that's uh, the Chinese room argument, as it was uh, put forth most famously by John Searle. It's been taken up by other people as well. So this has been Tom Lin, and I'm talking to you, actually, uh, in uh, from a parking lot. <laughs> you can't necessarily tell at the brick wall here. And uh, I don't know, it's like almost 2 o'clock in the morning. But I want to get this video out there, and... Uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. So, anyway, I'll talk to you guys later. I hope you're having a lovely evening, and uh, we'll catch you on the flip.